Welcome, everyone. It's really a great pleasure to introduce Jürgen Meyer this evening, and I should say to welcome him back to GSAP, since he has taught numerous times here in the past. So tonight represents a long overdue visit, giving us the pleasure to catch up with his recent work. There are many words that come to mind when thinking about the work of Jürgen and his practice. Boldness, freshness, playfulness, humor, form, figure, pattern, speculation, contemporary, past, future, surreal, contextual, virtual, material, fluid, physical, smooth, scale, atmospheric, sensational, sensual, irreverent, and I could go on. These words are important not in themselves, but as taken together as a register for the fact that Jürgen's work is not neutral. It is not only impossible to stay indifferent to it, it actually demands of us that we react and that we engage with it, whether to reject it or embrace it. In our age of information, where we are overloaded with images and architecture centuries old, agency in producing meaning is said to have long been replaced by other forms of communication, Jürgen's work surprises with its insistence to do exactly that recapturing architecture's territory to offer a unique building scaled and material exploration at the intersection of architecture, communication, and new technologies. Spanning from urban plans to buildings and from installations to objects, Meyer's work recasts the relationship between the human body, technology, and nature to produce new kinds of spaces and invite new forms of coming together that reinvent every day as well as our relationship to each other and to the spaces and environments beyond. As an architect whose practice is still considered relatively young by the standards of our profession, and with a sense of deceiving ease and almost effortlessness, Jürgen has already succeeded in building an extensive body of work around the world out of his native Berlin. Actually, is it your native Berlin? No, not native Berlin, <laughs> but <laughs> Stuttgart. But he's practicing in Berlin. Even more impressive is the quality of the work, seemingly light and yet consistently arresting. His work has also a sense of standing on its own and on its own terms, reframing the boundaries of the discipline to include everything from his personal obsessions with patterns and privacy as a register of our contemporary lives to his whimsical embrace of 70s figures and motifs, expanding architecture, architecture's historical archive to, rehab, to rehabilitate for tomorrow what only yesterday was still considered kitsch, or to his polemical manifesto for, quote, beige, a manifesto he recently wrote jointly with Philip Obsbrook for, his pa for this past fall Chicago Architecture Biennale, not without many ripples, uh, we heard. In that sense, I believe Jürgen's contribution to the field, as well as to redefining architectural practice for today, is, a, is not only refreshing, but also important as a model of independence, of design research and originality that is slowly but surely constituting, constituting an ever-evolving body of work whose inner workings are not so much following a previous generation's obsession with the signature and authorship, but rather exactly the opposite, the uncertainty and messiness of a process that takes it all in to produce a timely architectural response that is at once specific and consistent. Please welcome Jürgen Meyer. Thank you so much, Amal. Um, thanks, Columbia GSAP, for the invitation. And I know you just have landed, so I hope <laughs> chat lag is not carrying you away. But it's great that you could make it. Um, we all are specialists in travel and infrastructure and mobility, so I think you are the perfect example for this now. It's um, also what I would like to talk about. It's mobility, infrastructure, conversion sites, and uh, public space. This is somehow the overarching theme of the projects I want to discuss today. And it's something that allows me to look into uh, the transformation of our cities, the way how digital culture um, changes the way we communicate and use our spaces, and how we can look at certain specifics that we discover um, on our building sites, take them, overemphasize them, and create new, uh, let's say, signages or um, iconic 
places that are unique experiences rather than a replica to other generic um, urban spaces that we see all over. So what I'm showing today is a project, and I'm starting with this one here, a joint project um, with Work AC, but also with three other architects. Um, it's a project that Terry Riley curated. Um, it's five facades on a generic parking garage in Miami. It's a project that um, is going to be finished soon, so it's actually the very most current uh, project that I can show. Um, the opening will be April 25th, in, uh, 24th in, in Miami. And it's a parking garage in the design district. What you see on the upper drawing is the elevation um, that shows you basically the different segments of uh, the different architects of so work AC at the left, and it's Chemire H, that's us, then Nicolas Buff, then uh, Manuel Clavel and Terry Riley, and on the firewall there is a text by Sagmeister Welsh. Uh, at the lower part, you see somehow how these fragments are put next to each other. And the process was very interesting. Um, it was called the Collage Garage in the very beginning, and five architects were invited to make concepts for segments of the facade for three axes. Um, and then we sent them in, we discussed them, and I want to show you which three possibilities we proposed. Um, then we got placed on the facade and started to create certain neighbor relationships um, with each other. So our first proposal that we made was uh, looking at the plates and the numbers, uh, the naming of uh, your car, kind of the addressing of the car. And we translated that into larger letters and numbers um, to create a facade structure. We had to keep about 60% open for air ventilation um, because of fire issues. And what you see here is a mesh with this pattern hanging in front of it. Uh, then translated that into a structural proposal. The second one was grids and grills, uh, basically the ventilation of cars, which is somehow the reference to the ventilation of the facades. Here it's um, kind of a mesh, a constructed mesh that is covering the facade. And we had only about three feet of depth to deal with. Um, work I see was a little bit more lucky. Turning around the corner, they have another I think three feet or four feet, so they could actually introduce program and spaces into that facade, which was not possible for the long facade. <clears throat> so here, this is one proposal, and then the third one were the lights. Um, and you see kind of the development of these organic, like strange shapes that happened in cars in the last 10 years. This was another motif where we wanted this kind of organic elements to glow in the dark um, and create this kind of um, face uh, that we know from cars as the image for the facade of the garage. Uh, we also made one version for the corner where it starts to peel off, and this became then our location somehow that we are sharing with Work AC, and I'll show you that in a minute. So we made proposals for all three of these variations, then it was, one of them was picked by the client, and then it got introduced onto the facade. The concept in the beginning, Collage Garage, came from the exquisite corpse idea. So you would start, um, you know, one would start with the head, and the next one, without knowing what the first person drew, would continue with the body and so forth. And you know these drawings. Um, it's a, you know, something that I found on the internet, so very generic. <coughs> or do you create this kind of strange um, bodies of composed uh, different kinds of animals? So it's something that. Um, was the guiding principle in the development of the, of the concept that Terry Riley um, initiated. Later on, it was moved into a different like, condition. It was now called, or it's now called Museum Garage, but that's more because it describes the location. There's a new museum next to it called ICA and uh, like a, a private collection museum on the other side. So it becomes a little bit of a new museum district in the design area. What you see here is somehow the concept that we dealt with, um, first developing this idea with the lights and these organic shapes as the glowing elements. <clears throat> and I only received actually a lighting test last night and I couldn't incorporate that into the lecture. Did you get that too, that email? No, I saw it on Terry's uh, Facebook page actually. Um, so after we got the first kind of location right, 
we started to negotiate with our neighbors. And one idea that we could develop with Work AC was this interlocking like puzzle pieces um, of the two concepts. So you see Work AC on the left with the stairs and specific pockets of spaces behind it. Then it's us, um, you know, which kind of interlocks spatially into uh, Work AC. And then the rest is basically how they concept developed it from the very beginning, very clear cuts from one to the other. So the idea of this exclusive corpse, I felt wasn't really working so much anymore. However, um, Terry and Manuel tried to do this kind of neighboring condition as well, where the bodies of kind of re replicated car bodies um, were then taken in two, three cases to Terry's facade, while I think some of the balconies um, Terry incorporated in Manuel's. In the end, it was not realized that way, so it's very clear uh, segments of the facades. <clears throat> but what you see here in our kind of proposal was a mediating between the two ends, which is one, an inversion from like work AC to our like free floating objects, um, and taking this kind of red and white diagonal strips of uh, markations, uh, traffic markations um, from Terry's facade or um, actually Keenan Riley's facade into like a larger super graphic and by overlapping these two it becomes somehow a mediator between the two ends of, um, of the, the garage concept. <clears throat> now by jumping closer into the design drawings you see these kind of different shapes. The ones with stripes are deeper so they have the glowing at night factor built in. Uh, and then there's a little drop that comes down to the street level. So these are the renderings where you see how it's also starting to peel off at the corner and these are the glowing elements at night. And this is the construction as it happened. Work AC here with the pink background and nothing that color is really glowing through this white surface. And then our scheme starts here. <coughs> I'm guiding you slowly around the corner so you see the different facades. And these images maybe are six weeks old or four weeks old. We didn't get any updates since then. But um, here you see these elements floating. And then the next one is um, Nicolas Boeuf. Here the super graphics that runs kind of independent from the organic shapes over the facade. <clears throat> Another kind of confusion. But if the organic shapes somehow cover the rigidness of the concrete, kind of structure behind it, then the patterns add another kind of confusion layer onto it and therefore creating a certain ambivalence of where are the boundaries of that facade and um, what are the kind of the depth qualities of, um, of that very thin skin that wraps around it. This one here is uh, Nicola Buff and um, it has more, let's say, direct uh, references to maybe uh, fair architecture and um, playfulness. Um, and it's a very kind of clear cutout facade, another maybe reference or neighborhood relationship that we have here, um, also floating, dealing with the thinness of a facade. Here you see these bodies of the cars from Manuel Clavel Architectos, um, and they are not the real bodies, but kind of cast in glass fiber um, plastic. And then Terry Riley's, or Keenan Riley's facade here with this uh, like security patterns. This is a movie that shows you very quickly um, how it sits in the context, and I think that gives a nice hint what will be opened in a couple of months, weeks. Now, this is a reference that um, is also important to us. And these are cars that uh, drive on our streets, but they are somehow already ready to go cars, like cars that work on, a, on, on, you know, on, on public streets. At the same time, they're still not really prototypes, but they're in the making, they're in the testing phase. Um, I'm from Stuttgart, as you heard earlier, and uh, there are Mercedes Benz and Porsche cars produced there. And we see that kind of car driving in our area quite a bit. Um, these are not Mercedes and Porsche, these are other cars, but you have this pattern that kind of irritates um, the design and um, 
it's somehow a, uh, kind of catching attention, at the same time confusing the real, let's say, final product. And this kind of in-between situation of not there yet and confusing at the same time, creating a certain curiosity, is something that interests me um, and might work quite well in this ambivalence of what um, discovery and covering up um, means at the same time. It references to things that are private or public or exposed and concealed. Um, there's a clear relationship between what's behind that surface and what is kind of seen. Um, and it's a condition that I found uh, in these patterns that I'm collecting for many years. We also did one of these cars um, for uh, the Toronto Design Week a couple of years ago. So that's a pattern that we found, but it does exactly the same as the patterns that we showed, um, that I showed earlier, <coughs> that comes from these data protection patterns that I'm collecting for the last like, 17 years now, or even longer. It's um, a, a technique or a technology that was developed around 2000, uh, no, sorry, 1900s, early 20th century, where the pattern became kind of an efficient tool for administration. So you could write the copy and um, original and the shipping slip at the same time by using the typewriter or like printing through different layers. All this, of course, is technology that is kind of out uh, of um, production today. The typewriter is not used anymore, but you still have something like this where um, you can write the pin numbers like through a multiple form, and you only discover it when you open um, the paper or you like cut it and peel it. It's something that um, also works in shipping slips, where this confusion of patterns and numbers actually confuses the information and covers up and makes a clear like, spatial distinction between who is in front of that information and who is like, inside that information. And it's a reference that I find interesting also for architecture, where this envelope um, of buildings deals exactly with a certain kind of um, covering up um, Divide, dividing between inside and outside, between a kind of concealed situation and an exposed situation. And of course, there are also windows that are clearly addressing or personalizing that building, um, which is quite similar in its strategy to envelopes and windows in envelopes. And I'm collecting these patterns now for many, many years, and they come as all kinds of uh, graphic uh, possibilities, either uh, names of cities as you have it here or logos from companies um, that are you know used on the inside of envelopes so when you hold an envelope against the light you cannot read what's written inside because it kind of camouflages or uh, confuses the, the, the writing on in the letter so all that um, becomes somehow a source material that uh, we develop step by step from a very tiny kind of graphic uh, condition and like a, a layer of negotiation between inside and outside, private, public, uh, and so forth, to a condition to be occupied and to becoming like the spatial condition that I think speaks of um, our, um, our time. This is an installation we did in the Berlinische Gallery, um, and taking that pattern that I showed you in the car, now even made larger to a human body scale relationship, where it's printed on a carpet, it envelopes the building uh, and the space, and it allows you to kind of occupy it in a different way than just going into an exhibition space. Um, you could also start to read or discover certain letters and numbers, but what was even more interesting in this exhibition were these 3D prints of patterns that were extruded spatially into like a third dimension. Um, and there were different strategies to do that, either by layering it like one after the other and um, like starting to mediate from one to the other, extruding, um, having two patterns run through each other. And the rule was that from one like elevation, it had to be the original pattern as it was found. So this was one kind of pattern that we had. Another one, which is a little bit more of a camouflage pattern. Uh, then here you start to see numbers already. This was a more um, floral pattern. This one here is quite obvious. You see the seven, the five, the zero, the nine, the five. And by layering and then starting to like relate them three-dimensionally, it creates this quite complex three-dimensional structure. <coughs> By going step by step into a larger scale, this is one possibility. Um, 
where we designed an exhibition for mobility and sustainability, kind of ironically for Volkswagen. And uh, what you have here is kind of a network of independent interdependencies where this kind of triangle that we all know, at least for me it was maybe the first time we realized that sustainability and consumption and production has to do with the future, um, shows you that there's a certain care of like what we do now might affect the future. Um, it's not so easy than the triangle uh, relationship that we see. It's um, uh, kind of a network of uncertainties, of dead ends, of um, interlockings, and translating that into a spatial experience with then all these kind of interactive stations to explore more on the content of um, mobility and sustainability in the future. Uh, by developing that into even a larger structure, <coughs> uh, this is a dining hall in Karlsruhe, we also explore the potential of this being maybe either a building or an artificial forest because it's at the border between a larger forest and the city. Um, here we built uh, a dining hall that was made out of timber, so it's one of like the early timber projects that we did, which have a polyurethane coating. And that tree-like structure or sculptural interpretation of these patterns into a larger entity is what guided us through the design process. Here you see how these layerings of timber then became the structure, prefabricated, put on site very quickly, and then coated with a three millimeter um, weather protection, created that space that becomes kind of a sculptural entity um, inside and outside. It wraps from the floor to this roof, but not just as a skin, but as a, as a structural um, solution. And when we jump onto a larger scale, this is a courthouse in Belgium um, on the West 8 master plan. We see similar understandings of how this material, in this case it's also timber, um, going all the way up to the 14th floor. The timber and the reference maybe to the tree is um, one guiding principle. At the same time, it's a courthouse that on that scale creates a certain, let's say, different form of atmosphere or approachability with a material that you wouldn't expect in a building like that. Um, Hasselt um, developed the whole area around the train station. This was the cargo train area a couple of years ago with a master plan by West 8 and the competition that we won with A2O and Lens Us uh, from Hasselt uh, was uh, kind of looking for two high points. One is this one here and the other one is next to it. And the one that was built first was the one that we won. It's a courthouse for Limburg. And Hasselt um, comes from hazelnut trees. Uh, they also have hazelnuts in their logo. You have these two hazelnut trees. And what's interesting, and I don't know if this is explicitly already developed by West 8 or if it was just a coincidence, um, there are always two high points in the city from important periods of the city. So you have the two Gothic uh, church towers. <clears throat> you have the two towers from the 1960s from the 20th century, which was the technical um, town hall. And then the new development also will have two high points um, to mark the city. So somehow there are nice references to like the, let's say, iconic image of Hustle with the two hazelnut trees embracing each other and kind of talking to each other um, all the way to the urban planning reality. And here you see the building. Of course, it also kind of echoes the industrial trusses of the, in, of the cargo train station. It, um, the wood might refer to the hazelnut tree or the tree as the place um, that locates you in community to speak justice or to have a communal meeting. And um, it has, on the other hand, a very nice, let's say, haptic quality that kind of contradicts or maybe softens the the power, or let's say the, uh, uh, the atmosphere of a courthouse, you know, that certainly is not a playful building that you want to go, but it's more of a building that you have to go. So some images um, that shows you how this timber really works in that scale, and I think that's a really unique experience that you need to experience on site. It's very difficult to show in pictures. And then the interior was done by Lenz Us Art Architects from Hustled that translated that idea into an interior concept. <coughs> There's also um, a cantina or restaurant at the top of the tower. 
But the building has three parts. So here is the courthouses. This is the main offices with the restaurant. And here it's the university um, justice department that has a library and also rooms to rent. Another conversion site that I would like to show. Oh, this is also um, then it made it to uh, onto a beer bottle, which I think is quite interesting. Thinking that it's a courthouse and where a lot of let's say maybe alcoholic problems in driving might be you know, discussed. Um, it's another uh, conversion site for university in Düsseldorf. It's a building that also deals with um, this long strip along a train track, although this all development is mostly housing and offices. And then here at the upper end, the north end, we have um, the building that touches the bridge here, um, but also mediates between the two levels, uh, the lower park and the bridge that connects um, the two sides of the city. We wanted to expand the spaces inside the building as much as we could um, and create a certain e efficiency by reducing the that necessary um, staircases um, to allow for more space inside for other like areas. At this point, that kind of pushed um, the envelope of the building outside, so we would have resting, spa uh, resting areas in, in case of uh, fire, or you would have a, kind of a little break and you could get some fresh air. But basically, it's everything that couldn't be handled by the interior stairs that would be done either by exterior stairs or um, waiting areas until the fire brigade would come. Uh, and this is what kind of marks the, uh, the kind of the, the quality of the building. You see all these envelopes um, peeling out as um, balconies to wait or to communicate, you know, uh, between floors. And this is what is becoming the design guiding element. Uh, the ground floor has the main um, lecture rooms, and here you see how the building. Kind of develops from larger spaces all the way up to like sh smaller areas up here, and it connects the upper bridge here down to the main um, park. And here you see that bridge being kind of touched with the cantilever here, and then it takes you down to the main entrance. <coughs> this is the other side. Um, again, the stairs that take you down to escape, and that bridge that touches the other elevation level. Some interior spaces where also the main staircase really becomes uh, kind of an experience. Um, it's attractive and spatially exciting, um, so you would actually like to go up the stairs and not take the elevators. Also an, an important aspect to like, run into other people, to communicate, to hang out. Um, there are waiting areas, there are little work areas and different platforms here or over here and it gives you like the spatial uh, experience of the outside also into the inside. Some of the meeting rooms are um, in parts where the facade really affects the interior. Um, the slanting or the, the, the rising uh, chairs of course echo the facade of the outside and vice versa. <coughs> and here again the view from the main entrance where you come down to the park level. We also built, and this is maybe just a quick um, panoramic view what, uh, what we are involved with other projects at this time. Um, this is another building for the same university in Berlin. We start construction with that one end of the year. This also has an interesting kind of technology built in. It's an infra light concrete. So it's a thick concrete wall which has glass fiber, um, sorry, glass foam pebbles or uh, adobe pebbles in the concrete, so you don't need any extra insulation. There is no other cladding. It's one thick wall that covers all that. Um, so it's a nice, really kind of solid uh, building that only gets these cuts with the windows. This is a high rise um, that we are building right now, also in Dusseldorf. We are up here now with the concrete slabs. Um, this is a housing project we did in Berlin a couple of years ago, but you see also some echoes of like smaller scale that you discover certain facade details that then later get translated into other scales. An office building in Hamburg that was finished a couple of years ago. This is an office building in Berlin where um, we are cutting the volume on the level of the elevated 
um, train that runs through Berlin, so you have a, a kind of an open floor um, that is more a communication floor for the offices below and above, and also relates to the more of like the, the kind of the traffic flow of the train on that height of the building. <coughs> This project, we are just handing in building permission, which is a parking garage and a hotel with a high rise in Düsseldorf as well. Um, another train uh, uh, rest stop we built in Georgia, and a train station that's just finishing now, um, also in Georgia. And this one is uh, connecting Turkey with Baku. It's a train track that was uh, built to uh, yeah, basically bring the goods from Azerbaijan towards uh, Europe. And since there's a change of the, uh, the sizes in the tracks, you have an international train station in the middle of nowhere, basically. So the, this one here, um, this building was financed by Azerbaijan, and uh, it's located at the, uh, at the intersection Aha Kalaki here from Turkey into Georgia. Georgia was an interesting part also in terms of infrastructural projects where <coughs> the country developed uh, quite rapidly in the last 10 years and it mostly involved uh, projects that dealt with rest stops, airports, um, uh, border stations and so forth and we were involved in a couple of them and I wanted to show you some projects that got realized, not all of them uh, all of the ones we designed were really put in, uh, in, in real material, but there were some, um, for example, this one here, um, rest stop along the new highway that connects Tbilisi with Batumi. And the rest stops had like f different uh, programmatic functions. Of course, there was a gas station, but also it would bring a supermarket or a farmer's market and arts and crafts market to it, which means um, that there's a certain infrastructure that hasn't been there before. They would also build these projects in areas where the highway would come much later, but it would create already a certain, let's say, dynamic, and it would show that there's a transformation happening um, in parts where uh, it might take a while to connect it with the highway. But it would activate the local um, communities. So these projects, uh, in this case, were opened with the first highway that we built, um, but it was also kind of a, a, an activator for the location, um, in this case, Gori. When we went there for the opening, um, we were already like, asked that what we would comment on uh, like two couples that were getting married and they wanted to have their wedding ceremony uh, or the wedding party after the wedding ceremony in the, high, in the rest stop. And I thought this was quite an interesting uh, proposal because uh, you know, for some people, their wedding is the most important day in their life. But uh, to have it in a rest stop, I think, shows also the kind of the curiosity and the urgency for something new. And this um, was one of the places where this could happen. We also built a rest stop um, and border station between Georgia and Turkey, and this is on the Black Sea coast. It's a building that is welcoming you or saying goodbye, but it's also a sign um, which says it's not a markation between two different countries. It's actually a place to meet. So it's a place where program, you know, that you can, uh, uh, spaces that you can rent, uh, shops where you go for shopping, but also the beach where you can actually swim all the way up to the beach. And you see here, this is kind of the line between Georgia and Turkey. Um, it's a little steeper here, so you can swim here, but it's a really popular beach and you have um, meeting rooms where you can have conferences or business uh, meetings. You have shopping area, you have uh, terraces um, to overlook the city, and of course there's a lot of shopping as well. So to understand the border more as a connector rather than a separator, I think is quite unique, and I don't really see that in other border stations. Um, it's maybe more of a concept of like airport hotels where you can have meeting rooms and you fly in, meet, and go back. But similarly here, this is the floor that you can rent, and it's above the checkpoints. Um, and it's a beautiful place to hang out, I guess, uh, and to have meetings. And also, I think a nice kind of gesture to 
welcome and say goodbye. It's basically the architecture along uh, the, the, the connecting routes uh, through the country. And us, um, Georgia is a country that is extremely beautiful, but for most people, it's just a transit country. So to understand the architecture along the transit is an important, let's say, cultural factor um, that was decided by the government to uh, use architecture as something that is, stays in your memory when you travel through Georgia. And this one also is um, a small airport that activates the local business and tourism. It's maybe one of the most tiniest airports in the world. It's 250 square meters. I don't know how much that is in, in square footage. But <clears throat> it's in Svanetia. The town is called Mestia. And you have a t tower, you know, which relates to the ancient towers here. But you also have um, a waiting area and a check-in area. So it's basically all three axes of um, X, Y, C. And one is before the security, one is after security, and one is the tower. And so it's quite, let's say, structurally clear in its programmatic display. So you have one, two, and three um, axes for the construction of the tower. There's also a little town hall um, that looks like this at night. And the police station um, in the new town and another project uh, that kind of deals with the idea of activating tourism and business is this now quite lonely public space. Um, it, it's a tower and a pier that was supposed to become the marker for a new development, a new city in Georgia and also a new port in Georgia. This is um, what it looked like right after we finished the project. There is a street here, um, there's a small town hall here, a little hotel which was already built in the 80s. But the idea was to build a new town for 500,000 people with a new port. At least this was the plan from the government. Now the government changed a couple of years ago and the plans were stopped. And so what you see is a little like sculpture that is the marker of the beginning or maybe the end. And um, here the town hall that is actually not doing anything for a town because there's no town around. But the structure itself, um, I think, was an interesting process to um, understand that by walking out onto the pier and looking back onto the land, you kind of uh, understand where the development comes from. It's um, an area where the water is deeper than usual. Um, it's a very flat uh, coastline in Georgia, so it's difficult for larger boats to come to Georgia <coughs> and um, deliver goods. So all of that was somehow um, put as a challenge for the future. And uh, the, the, the elements were constructed in Turkey. They were brought to the coast in Georgia and then built up to this sculpture that glows at night like this. It's um, maybe sad or it, it's a sign to the future. It might be reactivated, but it's maybe one of the most lonely public spaces that I know. Um, it sits there um, in the... In, on, the, on the coast and is waiting for kind of a rediscovery. But um, it might also be a, it's a, a nice, let's say, memory of a moment of a, of a kind of a, a future that, that was constructed. Now, jumping from maybe the most lonely uh, public space to the most busy public space, that's an installation or project that we developed here for Times Square in New York. And it's called Triple X Times Square with Love. It's a project that's commissioned by the Times Square Arts Alliance. And it wants to like, experience that space in a different way. We were thinking of how the technology and the media of that space really relates to our spatial and communal experience um, that we have there. And of course, the mobile phone and let's say the, the documentation that we are there was an important factor that we wanted to consider in this project. Um, the X, of course, relates to the intersection of Times Square, um, the Broadway and 7th Avenue um, X, but also it relates to a certain history of um, Times Square. Here it's placed next to the Recruition Pavilion, which I think is maybe the safest place on Earth where you can have a nap. Um, there are always some soldiers with machine guns standing next to you, make sure that you don't get disturbed. 
Um, but it refers also to kind of a more seedy history of uh, Times Square. And I remember when I was uh, studying um, in the 90s, this was just the moment when all these movie theaters closed and uh, the f early like first art projects kind of took care of that history and kind of you know, looked at the transformation of that um, area. This is maybe another also hint or uh, reference to that moment and takes that XXX history of Times Square again in a kind of playful way into the everyday experience, of course now with a more humor aspect to it. But once you're lying down on these X's, you have to negotiate like who is stretching out the legs, who is kind of, who was there first, um, how many people fit on one. And really after like three seconds when it opened, um, they were busy and I think since then there's always somebody lying on them all the time. What we wanted to explore is the relationship of like the, a vertical experience. So when you're looking up, you know that actually you're looking into many webcams and your broadcasters all over the world. So this is the view that you might have, but actually the webcams might see you lying down on these axes. And if you could log in somehow seeing yourself lying there, kind of highlights or, or kind of shows you that relationship of media presence and um, real presence in space. So. This is one of the images from uh, the webcams that you see there. Some others you know, that explain to you when you use a Snapchat filter or when you want to communicate that you have been there at the right time, um, at the right place. This is just a random moment uh, where you see the axis lying down there. So we wanted to connect that with our social media experience or like, performance that we do every day. And um, this is what we simulated. Uh, it was, of course, in media, and if Times Square can't manage to get media attention, who else can get it? This was in the cab uh, when I drove home that same night, and it talked about how you know, Times Square now has a different experience. But also two weeks later, um, it was the image when New York Times talked about the real estate market. And, the transformation of that area and that when you get really get exhausted looking at different um, uh, options in the real estate market, you can go there and lay down and have a little bit of a break. And what's nice as a reward also that last year it was also named as one of the 10 places that defined the New York City reimagination um, of its urban spaces. From that kind of very busy, urban place, which was already busy, but it transformed somehow the perception of the place. Um, I want to jump to the last project I'm showing today, which is Metropole Parasol in Sevilla, which was quite a deserted place when the competition was launched, but now turned into something that is extremely busy and you know developed somehow into more than what the city expected it could do for the city, but also for the citizens. It's uh, in the very heart of Seville. <coughs> It is um, on the former side of the market, and it was kind of empty for the last 30 years when the competition launched. This is the largest medieval town center in Europe. All of that was development in the, like after 1950s, basically. Here you have still some old parts of town in Triana, but this is basically everything that was kind of containing the city till, until the 1950s, more or less. What you have in this very dense fabric of the city are these um, huge like, buildings or inter interventions. This is Metropole Parasol, there's the bullfight ring, this is the cathedral, then the, uh, there's uh, the Alcazar um, castle. So it's mostly like very specific places that guide you and orient you inside that fabric. But it's not, never really like big plazas like in Madrid or in Barcelona that create an open space. It's more institutions or buildings that kind of dominate or define that place. Here it was the market, <coughs> and now it's Metropole Parasol. It's a place that um, brings back kind of the heart of the city to Seville. When the competition was launched, the city really worked quite well here in the lower part, and you have the cathedral, you have the town hall, you have the Alcazar. Um, the bullfight ring. The northern part was a little shady and not really well kind of developed. Now the hope was with this location to have different 
like scales of, let's say, interrelationship. One was to bring the development of the lower part into the northern part. One was to also compete with other Spanish cities who all kind of showed their innovation capacity. And then, of course, international attraction and um, innovation uh, in terms of business um, relationships. This was the site uh, during the competition. The city wanted to build a parking garage three stories or four stories deep and into the ground. And once they took out the earth, they found all these Roman ruins and mosaics. And that's when everything stopped. And the city used that moment to rethink the window into history and also what could urban space in the 21st century be. So this is the market here um, where you see it's kind of a city within the city uh, with a wall around it. Um, it was taken down in one half in the 1970s to build the end point of, a, oh no, in the 50s to build the end point of a bus, um, bus line and then in the 70s to take it all the way down. Um, it was too small anyway to kind of feed and support the growing, the fast growing city, but also it became structurally quite um, problematic. Today everything would be done to save them, but in 1970s it was more important to have the cars coming in, um, creating a temporary parking lot. And this was a temporary parking lot for about 30 years. Now when we decided to work on a competition, um, the first thing that I had in mind was shadow as the main element or material to bring to the site. It was um, an experience that I had when I was at the World Expo in 1992, where it was so hot and humid that shadow was the most valuable um, gift that you could get. And so the idea of a roof um, that would float over this plaza was um, the first gesture. And then we had to bring down the loads in very specific points where we were allowed to go into the ground, into the archaeology. And that's how these loads became stems and these mushrooms or trees um, developed. Then there were certain references to neighboring plazas, for example, these huge <laughs> grown trees as somehow a natural version of our built um, setas, as the civilians call it now, um, or the undulated stone roof of the cathedral and the interior structure as the space-defining element. Um, so the structure becoming kind of the architecture. <coughs> you get also the different layers now. Um, so first we start with the roof, taking down the load into the basement. Um, then there's the ground floor with um, the market again and some commercial areas and restaurants. The elevated plaza as the roof of the market, but also another kind of activator for the city. And then a restaurant up here and um, walk on the roof. Now, when it came to implementing this design concept into reality, we had all kinds of options that we researched. One was timber with reinforced, uh, timber with uh, coating or no coating. Uh, we had reinforced, dust fiber reinforced concrete, or um, also steel construction. And the timber was always the solution that kind of survived all three um, iterations with the cost um, kind of predictions with uh, the construction company and also then in, in the end with um, the overall construction company. So um, we looked into timber in relationship to financial or like cost development, how it would behave um, during heat and cooling down in, in, at night. So the expansion is an important factor. Uh, what would be the prefabrication qualities, what are uh, the sound pollutions during construction, how does earthquake um, you know, affect the building and so forth. So all of that became a really complex matrix um, and always guided us to this um, timber, la layered like uh, timber construction that you see here. So the process is um, quite interesting. It's a, it's a lamination of different uh, layers. The timber comes from Finland. It's produced in Bavaria in Germany. Um, it's cut and prepared there. Then it was shipped um, or put on trucks brought to Seville. And then in Seville it was coated and um, prepared for the implementation on the construction site. It's supposedly the largest timber construction in the world, as our engineers told us, but it's also the largest glued or bonding technology building in the world where all the cantilevering parts um, of the roof 
are actually glued together, not like you see steel joints here, but these rods are glued into the timber because that transfers the forces much more equally um, and dis equally distributed than by screwing these pieces into the timber. And you see that um, in the section here, this is the steel rod, this is the glue, and this is the timber and the polyurethane coating. Um, <coughs> this was developed with the Fraunhofer Institute who developed that glue, and this only existed at that time uh, maybe for two or three years. It was finished in 2011, so this would be like 2008 or 9. Uh, and we had to make tests if that timber, uh, if that glue would also work when it's, if there's fire, or when it gets really hot in summer, so the glue would start to maybe melt or become a little bit elastic. Um, the test showed only the first five centimeters would be problematic, and the rest is actually okay because the timber really insulates it. So here, once it's actually delivered to Seville, um, it's coated with the polyurethane that I showed you earlier, also for the dining hall in Karlsruhe. And here you see these kind of pieces that are then packed, brought onto a construction site, and put together. These are the steel joints, um, and I think logistic and uh, kind of control of like what goes where is really important in this case. Um, you see two concrete towers that are for the elevators, and we had to build them for earthquake issues and fire issues. So here you have the elevators going up and down. But all the rest is timber construction, except for the larger spans um, on top of the earth, um, the archaeology, which is Fiendel in steel. <coughs> but here you see some construction pictures, how it's put together. Um, the vertical parts are put together in, like, uh, in a seamless U-shaped metal. But once you know, we've reached that point here, you have the cantilever and the glued um, steel connection, the steel rods that I showed you earlier. It's quite traditional in a certain way how it's put together. You have this steel, like spatial steel skeleton underneath where you can rest the elements onto it. And then once it's all like put in tension, you can take it away again. And then you create this beautiful, like undulating uh, shapes that are creating spaces up there. Um, you walk through them, you walk on them. Um, this is again the archaeology downstairs where it sits on, and this would be this part here. Everything that's dark is either steel or concrete. The lighter beige parts um, is the timber, and it's beige, uh, now I'm referring to your introduction, because there are a lot of like sand winds coming from Africa, so we wanted to have a color that doesn't make the building look dusty very quickly. So anything that's either too white or too dark you know, would be problematic. So the beige is really the kind of the low maintenance color um, for the project. And also, of course, you see it um, as a traditional color in Seville. The dimensions are about 150 meters long, 35 meters high, and 75 meters wide. So it's times nine in feet, <laughs> um, I mean, uh, times three in feet. So this is the... Uh, the aerial view that you see from above. So you see it's an open grid, but it brings the shadow down onto the ground um, and makes the important, let's say, material that we wanted to create. In dialogue with the existing buildings, I think it really creates its, um, it, 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 it plays its kind of power most uh, best. It shows somehow the kind of the relationship of this big roof with the neighboring buildings that are not built as plaza facades, they're built as very small LA facades. And once the fabric got ripped out because either you know, the cloister got bigger or the plaza had to be, uh, the, the space had to be created for the market, um, all of a sudden they became exposed to a larger space. So here you see the shadow um, that is projected around noon. Um, and this would be a close-up of that shadow, but a couple of hours later, this might look uh, like the shadow um, of um, later afternoon where it becomes a swoop. <coughs> and also projections of that shadow onto the uh, architecture itself is constantly changing and looks differently. So here you have all these beautiful, let's say, projections. And maybe that's the, one of the main reasons to create that roof, because it animates that space in a completely uh, unexpected way. some images how it's put into the city. And when you're going up onto the roof, you'll see, again, the high-rise, uh, the, the, the skyline of the city with this 
um, church tower, the Giralda, um, the main, let's say, anchor of the city and uh, the best viewpoint that you have. It's open for um, civilians uh, for free and as a tourist you pay a little bit, but it's really important for the city to make it part of your promenade and Sevilla has a promenade culture. You go out in the city, you meet your friends, um, you walk and you might walk up to the parasol, have a look at the city and go down again and continue. Um, so this is what, what you see from further away. It's not really um, part of the skyline. You might experience it or discover it when you actually get closer and all of a sudden you're underneath it. But there are some points in the city where you get kind of a view of it. But now at the end of the lecture I would like to show you how it really arrived in the city. And this is, um, I think, the exciting part where all the expectations that were kind of put into it and let's say the adventure, uh, the adventure and the, uh, let's say the kind of expectations and hope but also the uncertainty somehow all culminate now in this um, kind of effect of uh, Metropole Paris. So the city itself, of course, now uses it to advertise the city. But also you can imagine that some did not like the project in the beginning, and this is the Semana Santa people, you know, the promenade, where you had, um, of course, the Catholic Church being somehow against it or fighting it. But the year after it opened, it was already on the cover of their program and leaflets, so they also understood that it was helping their Semana Santa. Uh, it also worked for Christmas somehow, <laughs> which is kind of cute. Um, this is a school in the neighborhood, and they use it for their crib. Um, so that's another version of it in a smaller <laughs> scale. This is Samana Santa, and it's actually, as we speak, um, it started yesterday and it runs till Easter. It's like a whole week of processions of, um, of these like, very heavy floats that you know, need like 20 men to like, be underneath and you hear the breath and they have to carry it and they will exchange after 10 minutes. And um, it's a really interesting process and there's a special music that goes with it. So again, that's kind of the iconic week in Seville besides the feria and social media, you document, you have been there, like you show other people they were at the same, you know, at the right place at the right time. Um, it's this relationship of a local experience and the media, a media kind of presence and communication. So this is again um, Semana Santa, and this is how it looks at night. So it's a really magic moment in the city. Um, then of course it works for all kinds of events like Flamenco Festival or public demonstrations. This was in 2011 and 12, right after the Metropole Parcel opened. It was the moment when Podemos was founded. It was the moment when Spain discussed about the future of their society and about the country. And in Sevilla, this was the place where these um, discussions happened. Um, again, a place that seemed to like have a feeling of the future. At the same time, maybe we didn't really know what happens and how to get there. This was the place to discuss this. <clears throat> this was the founding meeting of Podemos, the new party in Spain, and they even used the Metropole Parasol as their logo. Um, they had sit-ins and workshops, and uh, this is maybe the first time that it's not a form follows function, but actually function gets organized by form. One of these uh, stems was the kitchen, one was the, of them was the, the Wi-Fi area, one of, one of them was the kind of the registration for all the discussion groups. So somehow there was a map and I took a picture and I can't find it anymore, which I'm really kind of sad about. Uh, shows exactly kind of how this week of, uh, weeks of demonstrations were organized around the six stems of uh, Metropole Parasol. And this is at that time, but also it could be a regular evening nowadays in summer where it's really busy. At that time, we were also allowed to sleep because discussing about the future is really exhausting. Normally, it's um, closing at around one o'clock at night, so there's a certain control factor built in. But at that time, it was also a place where the city you know, embraced the discussion and allowed that place to actually work for 24 hours. But I also find it in social media, for example, here, um, if, uh, not social media, I find it in the, uh, in the internet in like music videos. This one here is a kind of cheesy Latino pop, but also it works for hip hop. Um, it works for other Latino pop. This is the elevator or the, on the roof. Um, it works for Bollywood music. 
and it works for Swiss um, song, pop songs. So all seem to kind of have a reference. And this is Miss Spain. She was competing for Miss Universe, taking pictures up there, but it didn't work out. Um, New Balance felt inspired for their souls. And then there was, of course, um, public viewing for the Euro Games. Um, again, a moment where it was really packed and um, part of a city. An action movie was shot there. And car companies like it as well. So here you have Mercedes-Benz kind of rebuilding um, digitally the spatial quality of it. Uh, but BMW was there. <coughs> also Jeep was there. Volkswagen was there. Actually, they moved it somewhere else. And also Renault was there lately. Um, also, for Grindr, it seems to work. Um, so it makes you look better, supposedly. And uh, Lonely Planet uh, also put it on their cover for Seville, but also called it the best place to travel to, number one in 2018. So that's maybe the biggest honor and the biggest achievement that the city wanted to get as an attention for kind of the activation and the kind of the improvement of their economy. Also Red Bull used it for one of their um, adventures. Uh, Gay Pride works well with it, um, the cartoon festival as well. Then that moves into somehow a fashion cover. Of course, there are like souvenirs, all kinds of souvenirs, calendars, that's kind of cute. Um, also street photography or street painting, um, this one for example. So it kind of plays the whole range, but it also has a couple of like offsprings. This for example was sent to me by a friend from India. It's a TV show, a sports TV show in India. So that um, has some kind of reference. And I'm not saying that we kind of invented this system, but there seems to be kind of a general um, like spatial, let's say, language that works on different scales. This one here is, I think, um, a, a lobby, um, a, a frequent flyer lobby or somewhere. And this is a shop, um, an installation somewhere else. So it's a nice kind of echo and, um, let's say, offspring relationship that happens here. And the last one um, that I find quite cute, and I always wanted to finish a lecture with a cat video. Um, this one here is, I don't get money for this, but I wanted to show you that even cat litter <laughs> was inspired by it. And they made tests for their cover, uh, for, the, for, the, for the packaging with all kinds of motifs. Supposedly, this one with the test consumers was always considered the best one. And I'll show you the video, and it makes sense. I, then I understood why they actually wanted to have it. This is now um, a cat video. Die Natur hat einen schlauen Weg erfunden, Feuchtigkeit aufzunehmen. Nach diesem Prinzip haben wir Cats Best entwickelt. Die pflanzliche Katzenstreu aus technologisch veredelten Aktivholzfasern, die Feuchtigkeit und Gerüche aufnehmen und einschließen. Und so auf vollkommen natürliche Weise bis zum siebenfachen ihres Volumens binden. Kompakt, ganz leicht zu entfernen. Und so hygienisch, dass die Streu bis zu sieben Wochen im Katzenklo bleiben kann, bevor der nächste Komplettwechsel fällig ist. Eine rundum saubere Sache. Cats best. The power of nature. So, it works on all scales. Um, what you see here is like wrapping up the lecture and showing you how this ob obsession with patterns, this obsession with like surfaces and how they become like spatial qualities, inhabited um, like environments, uh, three-dimensional um, like realities is somehow the search and research that we are doing and anchoring that in different realities in different kind of contexts in relationship to mobility, in relationship to public spaces, in relationship to new uh, material, materialities and construction possibilities is somehow how um, we see our office explore an architecture of today and maybe of tomorrow. Thank you so much. <clears throat> <coughs> Well, thank
Thank you, Jürgen. Um, I don't think there's been a better ending to your lecture than your cat uh, advertisement. Um, I was thinking, you know, both in preparing for just tonight and also just listening to you speak, you know, how, how is it possible that, you know, someone who's based in Berlin, you know, the most contextual, polite, you know, built, built you know, to the street edge, uh, uh, kind of be incredibly rational with the, you know, technology, et cetera. You know, you're like almost the opposite, I w you know, and yet I, by the end of the lecture, <coughs> I thought actually you're probably one of the most contextual architects practicing today, and I wanted to, open up a little bit this question of context. Um, um, I think it's so interesting that you're working in places such as Georgia, really articulating, uh, you know, one of the sort of uh, maybe most important uh, um, sort of roles architecture has come to play again today in the kind of global context, which is to bring to these places a sense of identity and a sense of iconicity. I think your, your work really embraces uh, notions of, of iconicity, but you're doing that uh, in a very different way than the sort of um, architecture which, you know, latches on to reductive cultural cliches of place or, or um, you know, you're bringing this kind of completely, uh, um, almost, you know, the patterns, the, you know, it's a completely different language that you bring, and yet somehow it works to create uh, this iconicity for, for these places. And uh, um, similarly, also, of course, the ending with uh, Metropole Parasol, right, which, which is this, uh, this, you know, beautiful structure that, cre you know, frames the context around it and through it and, and, and really becomes of the place and then, uh, um, so, I, so I wanted to come maybe explore this question of context a little bit um, with you and, uh, you know, um, which is a kind of much broader, I think, question for you in, 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 in your work. And I was wondering, <coughs> for instance, in, in Georgia, you, you seem to have developed this, you know, fantastic relation with, I guess, the government or, you know, wh how, how is the work received or understood or like, what is the conversation mm -hmm. around um, what it communicates and how and at what scale? Well, the context question, and I never really like, thought about it uh, until now you asked this question, um, maybe comes from like the education that we all got in the 80s, where you know, the city was just kind of rediscovered again, at least, you know, then also in, uh, translated in, in, in educational patterns, where usually it was kind of referred to as placemaking or um, like typology or a certain like fabric of the city that kind of had to be reinstalled. It was about like access and visual mm -hmm. connectivities and things like that. And especially in Germany, which was so much destroyed, um, it was all about regaining maybe something that was lost. But it didn't feel like it was kind of relevant for our generation. Mm -hmm. It might have been important for, you know, like a generation who actually felt the loss. Um, uh, we grew up in this like different kind of reality There was disruption, there was um, new construction, there was this clash of old and new, and um, so I've, I don't know, it, 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 maybe the, the, the sensitivity for that kind of place making or this uh, certain, like say, repair of the city fabric was there, but maybe our generation had to define it or had to find mm -hmm. it with a different like language. And when we look at places, there is something that we find is unique for a certain place, and that might be very intuitive. Um, it's not the general, like, this is a place, this is an axis, this is a symmetry, and so forth. Um, that might be part of the articulation of that understanding later, but um, it's usually some condition or some factor that I find interesting, and by taking that and overemphasizing it, maybe similar to, like, a metagraphic or, mm -hmm. like, a super graphic, mm -hmm. um, becomes the frame to then incorporate all the other program. In Georgia, it was somehow a moment where the early ideas, how we developed over years, then 
had a chance to be implemented very quickly. We didn't have much time to really think of a project. It had to be very, like, first reaction, like, very spontaneous, intuitive reaction to a certain site. And having a vocabulary and having a certain repertoire um, was kind of helpful to, like, use and then transform um, and, and put in place. Um, you could say that it certain, certainly echoes some of, let's say, Soviet, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, 70s, right. like, Bold, bold architecture yeah. from that moment. But also it tried to find a certain, let's say, poetry um, um, from that space and like introducing that into a different, um, let's say, spatial uh, experience. So Georgia was, it's not happening anymore. Like, you know, we're done with Georgia, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was a moment which was quite exciting. It was a time that needed a lot of like help in the transformation. Um, and we were one of a couple of offices, international office brought in, but also in collaboration with local offices. So we brought our maybe, uh, let's say our experience and expertise from outside, but we also learned a lot from the local architects. So there was actually an interesting dialogue. And um, it was a moment, I usually compared to maybe post-war Germany, where mm -hmm. a lot of buildings just had to be built to make the city or the country run, like a train station, um, a rest stop, uh, a, a, an airport, and things like that. So they might not actually exist that long. You know, They might be important for a certain moment in time, and then they get replaced when the, the country develops. Mm -hmm. I love the uh, the one on the border between mm. Turkey and I mean t you know in terms of super graphic and a sort of two dimensional kind of figure um, does it is it inhabitable that one you showed the section but well, it's not yet, you can go up the tower and then up, some okay. of the can leave us our platforms that you can go out and then ups up the the roof on top of the checkpoints um, are the conference rooms mm. um, so you mentioned. Uh, uh, materials, uh, you know, sometimes you build in steel, you've built quite a bit in timber, actually, uh, and, and sometimes in concrete, but the materiality <coughs> never becomes part of the expression, right? I mean, there's a kind of abstraction of the materiality, it's sort of mm. covered up and, and polyurethane, and I was wondering if you could, exp you know, does that, would that work against the kind of graphic quality or like this kind of Resistance to expressing the. the but we we look at the atmosphere and the in the in the space before we look into materials. That's it's somehow different when we do small objects like chairs or furniture. Uh, it's usually taking material and exploring that potential in that scale. For example, temperature sensitive paint then becomes a surface to lie on, and you create an imprint of your body. For example, or elastic glass mosaic from Bizzazza, you know things like that. Mm -hmm. Trying to define different. Um, let's say qualities with the material that we see. Um, with the buildings, it's the other way around. It's usually the spaces that are interesting, and then we find the right technology to build them. For example, the dining hall, which was the first timber building that we did, was actually conceived as a concrete building, and the budget just mm -hmm. didn't allow us to do that. So we had to find different ways to build it within the budget, and we found timber with the polyurethane as a solution. And um, so kind of the budget restriction forced us to be innovative in a certain way. Um, and that guided to all the other projects that we built with it. And in the end, also Sevilla, the Metropole Parasol. But now there's this new thing that really is interesting, the concrete with the foam um, mm -hmm. pebbles inside. And we are not the first ones building it, but still it's not like, um, an official construction technology, so you always need special permission to do it, and you have to apply for that, and we just got it about half a year ago. So that's a new way to also work with a solid material, which I think is nice, and you see that as a, an entire sculpture. It's not so much a tectonic building, but mm -hmm. a, a, a kind of a frozen liquid building. And the polyurethane also does the same thing. You know, when you have this different elements and you code it, then it creates, um, let's say, an entity rather than um, a, a, a puzzle Collection by of parts, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I did want to come back to Beige because I, I actually really liked your manifesto at mm. the Chicago Architecture Biennale and you didn't mention it tonight, but you could see it, you know, across the um, the projects and, and uh, I, you know, I think there's few architects who um, today will make claims on color, and so I, I also think it's interesting to make a claim on not only a color, but what is considered usually a non-color. Mm. Uh, um, and uh, and in your manifesto, 
that you wrote, uh, there was a sense that you know, beige is the color of war and desert today and the sort of the generic city. Um, uh, and, um, and it got very strong reactions, I heard, in, at the Binale. Mm. There was kind of... Uh, so I don't know. I wanted to talk about color and talk about beige in particular. That's a good time. Yeah, I, I'm happy to explain it again because somehow it actually works very well with the school here. When, <laughs> We're beige. No, because when, when I was teaching here for the first time, Mark invited me to come here and teach. It was somehow a reaction to his book on whiteness in architecture. And um, around the same time that I read his book, or yeah, maybe a couple of like, months or years later, I also um, came across two topics of beige, which one uh, was uh, this discovery that the cosmic color is beige. Uh, we are cooling down from a li red light mm -hmm. source to like a blue cool light source. And that right now we're in the phase of a couple million years of beige um, universe color. At the same time, um, the other kind of reference was uh, a story I heard about gated communities in Phoenix where when you buy a house there, there's a very limited color palette of different beige that allow you, you know, to paint your house with. Uh, and basically it's an economic factor because if you would paint your color in yellow or pink, the value of your neighbor's house would go down because nobody would buy a house next to a yellow house or a pink house, for example. So I was interested, what's the power of beige? You know, what is, what is this um, thing? And so when I was invited to teach here, this was the beige studio. Um, that I taught with Mark Kushner, and uh, we were exploring beige in all its facets. So it's, um, it was a research on beige and tourism, mm -hmm. beige and military, beige and age, um, beige and um, shopping, beige and real estate. Um, so each student became a specialist in one relationship um, and then developed their own project out of it. So war and military was only one aspect. Um, now, uh, of course, with the presence of all these like, wars in the near and Middle East, um, it becomes kind of unavoidable to think of beige uh, in relationship of war. But we wanted to document somehow the production of architecture globally um, as something that reduces its color palette and mostly it's beige, at least in Germany. It's not related to like its spatial or like aesthetic expression or like sculptural quality or it really goes across, you know, all kinds of agendas from reconstruction to whatever neo tectonics to the even, let's say, organic architecture. It seems to be um, a phenomenon that is not even talked about mm -hmm. because beige always comes across as given rather than chosen. Mm -hmm. And, or like skin. Uh, yeah, and we wanted to kind of mm -hmm. highlight um, that it's, uh, it's not an innocent color. Mm -hmm. It's something that does with us, maybe unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And comparing this kind of collection research of beige from like high-end you know, architects to no-name architecture production and c compare it or put it next to the destruction of our beginning of culture, you know, the destruction of uh, Palmyra and all these things. So. The dust clouds, dust. you know, the beige dust clouds versus the production today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, and this was then done with Philip Ursprung. Right, we right. developed that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I thought it was really um, interesting. But beige doesn't work for Miami. That's true. <laughs> you have to go. We went pink and you went red, red blue, and white. Um, so, well, I'm, I'm, I, I think we should be talking more about color. So, I think it's really um, interesting to open up that conversation and I'm glad it started here at the school. I think uh, that the, the, I didn't really get the, the kind of the reactions in, in, um, in Chicago to the beige topic. Well, I think it was a, the pro-white people. It was maybe the pro-white people, but it was kind of considered as something that is pro-neoliberal and I didn't see right, that no. way at all. And maybe we have to communicate it in a better way because it was not about pro-corporate architecture. It was actually, creating a certain sensitivity for a phenomenon that seems to be at work. And you know, either we like it or not, but it's a kind of a, a creating awareness for a moment um, that we are facing right now in architecture. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I, I thought it was, it really <coughs> ca captured uh, this time. There's a kind of mirror image between the expansion in Phoenix and Dallas and Houston and, mm. and then the clouds in the Middle East. And you know, it's kind of this oil, uh, transfer or um, um, uh, 
and so we also we designed a project in Orange County where the lifestyle mall had to be beige, mm. right? So we had to cover it and with the green screens. And but I, I think it's a very interesting um, sort of proposition to to think about. Uh, the non-neutrality of, of beige somehow. So why is your project in Miami pink? And, and that's because of um, uh, Miami Vice mm -hmm. <laughs> and the pink flamingos. Okay. <laughs> and uh, what's his name again? Don Johnson. Don Johnson. Okay. Uh, so that's Miami for you okay. right there. <laughs> Cultural reference, <laughs> highly sophisticated <laughs> cultural references from the 80s <laughs> in Saudi Arabia, actually, where I watched Miami Vice. So um, uh, maybe we should open it up for questions. Well, the, of the, the durability of the poly wood over the decades and is it popular with our fine feathered friends, similar to Rome or Venice, where the, the pigeons are all over the place? So, so. I didn't get the second part of the question, uh, sorry. Well, uh, is it popular with our fine feathered friends, the, the pigeon and other birds? Oh. So. Um, we have, they have a falcon, you know, that they have, have, have a falcon fly over it, like, I think, once a month. Um, and so that seems to work. Um, they actually no, they have no problems with... Um, Pigeons, not that I would know, but uh, yeah, that that could have been a big problem. But supposedly at this point, no, it's no not an issue. The polyurethane on timber um, seems to work really well uh, in Sevilla, especially because uh, the climate also, you know, it's it's warm and dry. It's not so humid, so it actually covers the timber and it has a couple of positive effects to it. It um, allows all the timber that is constructed being a structural timber. If you would not have the polyurethane, you would actually have to add two centimeters of timber on both sides as a weathering uh, timber layer, and then the inside would be the structural, um, uh, the structural timber. Um, also, the polyurethane helps you to not have to repaint it all the time, you know, to cover, like to paint the wood. Um, so it has these both aspects. But the, tim uh, the polyurethane doesn't have any like, solution um, built in, so it, it doesn't go bad. It just has to be repainted once in a while. That's what we were told. And it, it stands already for six years so, or seven years, so it seems to do okay. You talked a little bit about patterns of use in social media. Obviously, you are a collector, um, and you archive patterns, graphic patterns. Um, can you speak a little bit to your conception of privacy and exposure, and how we as designers can envision the way that the user is going to play into either digital patterns or social patterns, physical um, what is your idea of privacy versus exposure? Mm. Um, but the pattern is maybe the last like, visible uh, tool that creates these certain divisions between private and public or that, uh, that, that creates certain filters of private information for, versus like, public accessibility. So if you have an envelope or you have these patterns on your PIN number, it does you know, conceal that information until it reaches you as the, as the receiver. Um, now, of course, that all moved into the digital space, where it's maybe not visible anymore, but you might experience it, or you might think you, you, know, you know how to create these filters or these kind of um, barriers. But in the end, are you sure they are um, working? That's kind of the question. So in a way, it, it, it highlights that issue of privacy, but with maybe the last like, material expressions of that strategy, how to cover certain um, private informations. Um, yeah. seem kind of anti-architectural. I mean, I'm too unhip to, to have ever used Snapchat, but I don't think there exists an architectural Snapchat. So now that people are, now that people are deleting, uh, uh, dropping out of Facebook and dropping out of Snapchat, I don't know, do you think that'll have an effect on mm -hmm. architecture? But the other uh, studio that I was teaching here a couple of years ago um, was um, a temporary space 
where the Hudson Yard is, like in that area, which was all about kind of thinking about the relationship of social media and architecture and how like wayfinding, how like let's say information on the way, on the go, how um, a certain let's say visibility and your digital body that you can construct, you know. It might be a different body than your physical body and might be in a different location than where you are, um, was part of the research that we did and we tried to find an articulation for that. Um, I think it's something that we have to work on um, and it's a reality that we deal with every day. So I don't know how that architecture might look like, but I think part of that is already in, 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 built in or part of the thinking that I showed tonight. Thank you for your talk. This time going through the work, I was struck by the way in which a lot of your work is so three-dimensionally, sculpturally, volumetrically driven and quite clearly, beautifully articulated. And then you have this other interest in the surface patterns and kind of encryptions that you're talking about. Um, then also on the parking garage, for example, it's really a, a facade intervention. And um, both types of work seem successful, but as I think about it, they don't naturally connect. You can't say, okay, working sculpturally leads you to this interest in patterns or vice versa. So for you in your method or in your thinking, um, where do they meet or do they confront each other and is there friction there? So, and you know, you have these gallery installations too, the super graphics. And I don't think too many architects are working <clears throat> at the same time on a kind of graphic sophistication and this really intensive spatial volum volumetric. So how is that, how does that play out in practice for you and in the creative process? Well, um, I try to explain this obsession translating into a like three-dimensional like structures with this 3D printed cube um, at the beginning of the lecture where the pattern becomes kind of enlarged and then interpreted three-dimensionally into a spatial entity. And somehow it's like thickening that layer, that envelope between inside, outside and you know, this dealing with the oppositions as an inhabitable space. So it's somehow an, an interpretation or a reading of that graphic as a three-dimensional entity. And that's when you get you know, these um, larger sculptural structures. So they become kind of ambivalent or blurring the idea of the layer as a, you know, as, as a dividing space and becoming um, a yeah, space in itself. So it's a space that maybe doesn't really have an interior and an exterior, an inside and outside. Um, uh, some of the projects, like the Seville project or the um, the, metro, the, the dining hall remain somehow in a skeletal face. They don't have a skin anymore. They have no like real boundary between inside and outside. They somehow are open. They are um, they are unfinished in a certain way. So this idea of unfinishing and kind of openness create a certain uh, ambiguity, maybe um, where you don't really know: Are you inside the building or outside? Is it like? Uh, I think that's somehow along the line where the buildings stand in relationship to the patterns. It's, it's blurring somehow the, the, the idea of the boundary. So, I guess, I mean, just, I, I, I was thinking also something <coughs> similar in that I think the pattern at times becomes three-dimensional three and at times you also layer another pattern, mm. you know, with the kind of window glazing and, you know, so there is a sort of surface pattern and three-dimensional pattern that, that sort of you know, come together and in, uh, and maybe Miami is the most extreme because you weren't, mm. you know, but, but yeah, you do have some sc sculptural kind of quality there as well. But you, yeah. I mean, you, it seems you, you play with both, right? It's but the Miami project is a good example. I mean, we came with a concept in somehow relationship to the car, you know, there's of course the, the lamps and the, the lights and, you know, they kind of defined the, the first strategy. And then once it got applied onto the facade, we contextualized it somehow by looking into its relationship to the neighborhood AC and the other end, you know, which was, it's, it's Terry um, Riley, like Keenan Riley. And then you start to reread your proposal mm -hmm. again and like fine tune it, adjust it and make it kind of work and contextualize it um, within that new um, let's say, 
yeah, context that you're creating. It. And that's maybe an example of how a process, mm -hmm. a design process works. See, you are a contextual architect. You didn't know it, maybe. maybe. <laughs> One last question. Uh, I was going to follow up on this, this idea of your ex extrapolating from uh, a pattern that's meant to disguise inf information. Um, to, to what extent that's an intentional uh, strategy in terms of this analysis of the way that, m that, that media is functioning in our public spaces in terms of absorbing attention and taking it away from actual pub publicness, let's say, to the extent that it's, you know, an individual experience of your robot. Um, is there a, a, a self-consciousness of trying to make the, the, the building literally a reflection of this kind of blocking um, pattern of information? And then on the flip side, the, 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 this, the, one of my ambivalences about this kind of hev heavily for formalized architecture is it's often signaling a kind of um, ex uh, exclusion in our context of New York, especially in, in, in the US, in terms of the way that it's applied. Um, whereas it appears that the, the, the frequently your work uh, takes the form of very public spaces that invite participation. So I guess there are two different questions, maybe. Well, I, 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 I want to see the pattern and the exploration of the pattern and exploding them or like, you know, enlarging them and, and, and scaling them up as a kind of a, a pre-architecture somehow. It's, it's, it's a, a search towards um, maybe a different form of building. Um, it, I don't see them as like the solution, I see them as more of a question. Um, and maybe they try to avoid certain, let's say, architectural elements like a real window or the stairs or, you know, things like a tripartito, you know, these kind of um, rules that we all learned in school. Um, and by trying to avoid them, they become, of course, abstract objects somehow. But they're not meant to actually create, and I don't know if I understood your question right, they don't, they don't mean to kind of create a distance. Actually, they are meant to create a certain, let's say, questioning eye or like a, a, a curiosity that then reflects into rethinking what the context or the, or, the, or the urban fabric around it also means. So it's somehow a catalyst or an activator for a different form of like urban perception and, and, and participation. And uh, the same thing ha then happens, of course, when they become real public projects um, where the quality somehow is a, a unique, specific place um, that allows its citizen or the people who live there to appropriate it as theirs. Um, a certain, let's say, reference um, that it's creating um, that urban context for them and then start to play with it, like interpret it. Like, that's why I'm, I'm so happy with all these pictures that I can show you know, with the civil project, how it really started to become part of the life and created a different kind of creativity and appropriation and transformation. Um, and that would not work if it's just a simple box or um, you know, a mundane or building. You know, in that case, it really seems to generate a completely different form of production. And um, I think that's uh, one of the advan like, not that advantages. This is one of the, let's say, power side effects. Of uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the power of, of that kind of um, work. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Jürgen. Thank you so much. Thank you.